1980, there were thousands of young people who left the cinema very disappointed because they'd just been to see Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. I'm sure you've all seen it. It ends on a cliffhanger. Darth Vader, the infamous bad guy, indeed all the bad guys have won at the end of the film. <coughs> Our hero Luke Skywalker is defeated and has lost his hand in the battle. And his best friend, his sidekick Han Solo, has been kidnapped. I'm sorry if I'm spoiling the story for anyone. You've had 40 years to see. If you haven't seen it by now, you're not going to see it. The fans of Star Wars would have to wait another three years to get the next episode. To see the end of the story. What's going to happen next? How's the story going to turn out? And some Christians, perhaps we as Christians, can treat the story of salvation like that. We've had the first episode 2,000 years ago. Jesus was born, he lived, he died, he was raised and ascended, and one day we're going to get the sequel. One day we're going to find out what happens in the next episode as Christ returns and finishes the story. Ties up all the loose ends. But for now, in the minds, I guess, of many Christians, we're just like those Star Wars fans between 1980 and 1983, waiting in between episodes. The Ascension was the end of one episode, we've been left on a cliffhanger as we await the promised return of Christ and we're waiting around for signs that the sequel will be released soon, coming to a cinema near you. That is a wrong view of the Ascension, though understandable. When Jesus ascended into heaven, it was not the end of the episode. It was not the end of Christ's work until he would restart it again one day at his second coming. We are not sitting around waiting for the sequel. In fact, quite the opposite, really. All of Christ's work from beginning to end is one great event. One great event. One great unending event. Without gaps. Without waits. Christ was born. He lived Fulfilled the scriptures regarding his life, his arrest, his trial, his death, his suffering, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and from heaven he reigns on his throne as the great commission is fulfilled through his church, going to the ends of the earth, and then he will gather his church to be with him forever as the new heavens and earth are united together at the great climax of the story. Often as Christians... There was a criticism from the Jewish community that the Old Testament just had in mind one coming of Christ. And as Christians we say, well there's two comings, he did some things there and he'll do some other things one day. But I think if we read the Bible rightly, I think there's one great event where Christ is always working. He was working while he was on earth, he's working from heaven and one day. Uh, the two will be joined together. One preacher likened the ascension to a detonator. When someone builds an explosive, I hope you don't have much knowledge of this. In fact, if, if we put this video on YouTube, I don't know if the uh, uh, heads of YouTube might <laughs> ask any questions if we're talking about how to build an explosive. But you construct the explosive, you have all the ingredients, all the pieces in place, but nothing happens to it until the detonator activates. Similar with the ascension. When Jesus ascends to his throne, he, he activates, he detonates the work that he came to do. The ascension is the coronation of Jesus. He's exalted to the right hand of the Father in heaven, and when the risen Lord ascends to his rightful throne, he begins his reign, and the work that he's put in place now sort of detonates as the gospel, the work of salvation, explodes Across the world, starting at Jerusalem, the epicenter of that detonation, that it spreads out with the Great Commission, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And when a king or a, I guess a prime minister in our context begins their reign, they start to make changes. For, for a few years, they may have had their manifesto in place, the things that they're going to put in place when they're in charge, and then the administration eventually takes effect. 
as they enter Downing Street or as the king is coronated and the impact of their leadership begins to show. That's what we see in the ascension. The ascended Christ then sort of detonates his work. With my first act as king. That's what happened, wasn't it? The king would be coronated. With my first act as king, going to put wrong to right. Well, that's Pentecost. Christ's first act as the ascended king. Pentecost is explosive, isn't it? When the sun came up that morning, the disciples were cowards, they were doubters, they were confused, they were locked in a room, no direction, fearful, no power, but then the newly coronated king passes his first act as king. With my first act as king, I will send my spirit upon my people to um, activate the work of salvation, to apply it to the lives of real people. And suddenly the work of Christ explodes. I said from that, the impact of the, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection then detonates, beginning at, say, that epicentre in Jerusalem, then the ripples, the echoes are felt until he gets to the ends of the earth in fulfilment of the Great Commission and of Jesus' words in Acts 1. Lives are changed, churches are planted, believers are empowered, communities are shaken. Remember in Acts 17, when the disciples arrive in, in Thessalonica, and you have that riot, remember, in the beginning of Acts 17, that riot there, and this mob takes some of the Christians to the uh, city officials, and they say, these men, these believers in Jesus, they have turned the world upside down. I think, is that the King James? I don't think the NIV has something a bit more uh, uh, tame. <laughs> but uh, the King James has something like, they turned the world upside down. It's like a bomb site wherever they go. They're making a mess of our communities. Their presence is explosive. They've, they've detonated something that's uh, running through our towns and cities. This is the impact of the ascended Christ. The world has turned against God. The world has chosen a new master in sin and Satan. Sin is a slave master that has turned the world upside down. God created the world with an order. You read that in Genesis 1. It's laid out in a very ordered way, but Satan disorders it. Satan turns the world upside down, ruining and corrupting and polluting everything through the power of sin. But there's a new master in town. This is the ascension. And he has defeated sin and all sin's sidekicks, including death itself. And as the newly ascended king reigns, he begins to turn the world upside down, or really the right way around again. He takes sinners and he forgives them. He takes rebels and he transforms them. He takes outcasts and he prodigals and he welcomes them. He takes the explosive power of the gospel and he ignites it in the towns and cities where believers are present. So what are the disciples preaching in the book of Acts as this power explodes? Well, they're preaching the cross, of course they are. They're preaching a repentance and faith. They're preaching the resurrection they're preaching baptism, but they're also preaching that the crucified, resurrected Jesus is on his throne. In fact, when you read, this is really central, isn't it? I mean, you start with Acts 2. Really, this is the central part of the message. Jesus is Lord, and this is what it looks like. This is how it fulfills the Old Testament, and the words spoken through David, and seemingly about David at the time, but really about a descendant of David, who will one day sit on the throne, and this Jesus is now Lord and Christ. As a new king in town. This is the proclamation through the book of Acts. His life-changing kingdom is going to spread. Sometimes like a seed that grows very slow. Sometimes almost like a, a bomb that explodes on a town as people come en masse to the Lord. So we're not in between episodes. We're not waiting for the sequel. Christ is at work in his world currently. We are bang in the middle of this explosion of the gospel message as Christ's rule and reign expands across the earth in fulfilment of his command as he's given all authority. The ascended Christ, in other words, is not on a break. I say it respectfully, he's not twiddling his thumbs, is he? Waiting for the next event, waiting for his father to say, well, now's the time we can get going again and restart some work and here's the second coming and, and so on. No, he is reigning. He's building his church. He's interceding for his people. He's making his enemies a footstool for his feet. And the last enemy will one day be defeated in death. Apologies for the rather lengthy introduction, but as the ascension is often underplayed, it's good to sort of put it in its, uh, 
in its place to demonstrate that it is in fact a momentous event. So now we're going to look at a passage related to the ascension. We'll look at John chapter 20. We, we are going to get there eventually. I just have a couple of things just to say on that. And I uh, wanted to make sure that we understood the ascension. There's not merely a minor event, not merely just an end of Jesus' earthly ministry, end of a journey he takes to heaven, not merely his farewell tour. This is the coronation of the risen, resurrected king. The ascension is crucial. It's a grand event. It's a cosmic event. But as you read through the New Testament, it's also very practical events. It's not just some, something for Bible college students to study. It's a real event that affects real lives. Just, just think about those verses we read in Ephesians chapter 4. It was the ascended Christ who gave gifts to the church. When he ascended on high, he took captives and gave gifts to his people. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip his people for works of service. So whenever you see gifts at work in the local church or in the worldwide church, that is because Jesus is ascended. We're really excited to have Deleth back with us, but Deleth's work on the mission field is a consequence of the ascension, because it's the ascended Christ who gave gifts of evangelism to his people. So Deleth is a walking, talking monument of the ascended king, of the ascension. The New Testament gives us lots of other practical reasons why the ascension is important. I'll just mention one that you'll probably be familiar with in Hebrews chapter 4. But perhaps we haven't connected it with the ascension. The author of Hebrews, whoever that was, certainly does. In Hebrews 4, it's about verse, verse 14, somewhere like that. It says, Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not, this is the consequence of that our high priest is one who has ascended into heaven. For therefore we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way. He descended in order that he could be tempted, so that he could ascend with this merciful, sympathetic high priest, yet of course he did not sin. Let us therefore approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So we don't confess our sin to a priest in an ivory tower who knows nothing about our struggles. We come to a high priest who is tempted like us, experienced and felt our weaknesses, and then ascended into heaven. And therefore we can come to the throne of God, to the ascended Christ, in confidence, because our priest knows us, he knows all about us, and therefore, the writer says, he can help us in our time of need. I want to focus on the practical reasons for the ascension, and uh, we'll get to John's Gospel, okay? Just, just mention that, because elsewhere in John's Gospel, there are, other than John 20, there are um, references to the ascension. Let me just, um, if I, let's, let's go to John 20, we'll, we'll read the passage, verses 11 to 18, and then I'll mention perhaps another incident in John's Gospel, because it does link in to the way that John chooses to present the ascension to us. In John chapter 20, we'll start at verse 11, we read this incident between Mary Magdalene and Jesus. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, and this is the verse we're going to focus on, do not hold on to me. For I have not yet ascended to my Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. First thing to notice is that the ascension, 
that the ascending Christ speaks to tearful believers. We see this elsewhere in John's Gospel, as I said, there's a similar theme here. Remember back in that wonderful chapter of John 14, the disciples are upset. Jesus is leaving them. They're upset about it. So Jesus explains that him leaving them is not the end of the episode. He's leaving them for their benefit and for the benefit of believers worldwide. He's leaving them to prepare a place for them so that we might be where he is. He's leaving them so that whatever we ask in his name, he will do it. Because the ascended king has all authority. He's leaving them so that he might send from heaven the promised Holy Spirit so that we will not be orphans. But that Christ may always be with us by his spirit. So the ascension is comfort for grieving believers. It's not just some, as I say, not just some grand doctrine for Bible college students to study and make themselves look intelligent. It's a truth of comfort that the reigning Christ is with us. We're not alone. We are not orphaned. He has sent his Holy Spirit as his act of king to send his spirit into the world to bring comfort, peace and joy. That theme then continues into John 20, where again this time it's a grieving Mary Magdalene who needs to hear the comforting message of the Ascension. Let's just set the scene here. Mary first encounters two angels. She asks the same question of the angels and of Jesus. Jesus is the one who's able to answer the question. The angels can't bring up quite so much comfort. Mary encounters these two angels, and John includes a detail here that no other gospel does. You know, we need to be switched on to this when there's little details that are included. Well, why is he included that? John includes a detail of where the angels are located. We looked at some of the differences between the Gospels and our Bible study a couple of weeks ago, didn't we, with the resurrection accounts. Where are the angels located in John's Gospel? Did you notice? Towards the beginning of that passage, it gives us very specific detail. John wants us to know this. In a way that other Gospels are sort of indifferent to mention this detail. They say, note one at the head and one at the foot. I don't know if that image sounds similar. Does that remind you of a biblical image anywhere else in the Old Testament? It may remind you of a couple. Yeah, so, yeah there's two examples of cherub, aren't there? Um, two pairs. Of course, having the tabernacle and, and the temple with these two in the, in the, presence, of the, in the presence of the Lord. Well, here we've got, got these two angels in the presence of, of where Christ was, where he was uh, buried. And of course, but going further back, because the, the temple takes up lots of imagery from the Garden of Eden, where you also have the two cherubim, who they were guarding the entrance to the Tree of Life. By itself, that might seem like a little bit of a stretch. But I think somehow we have a kind of a, a, an, an Eden picture here. These two angels, one at the head, one at the foot. John uses lots and lots and lots of images from Genesis, if you remember back to our studies in John, and to the temple as well. It's interesting that John highlights those Old Testament images, because John gives us another detail. So if that detail were alone, okay, that might be a bit of a stretch to Eden. But what does John tell us about the location of the tomb? Though I don't think any other gospel tells us. It tells us that the tomb was in a garden. In John 19. The place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in that garden was a tomb in which no one had ever been laid. So John draws our attention first to the fact that this scene is taking place in a garden, and in this garden there are two angels. Of course, anybody who knows that their Bible is seeing this scene, and they're picturing this scene, and this is very Eden-like. And then, who does Mary think Jesus is? thinks he's the gardener. Why does Mary think Jesus is the gardener? Well, in a sense, he is. What was Adam's job in the Garden of Eden? He was the gardener. He was there to tend to the garden. It was the first job. The first Adam was to tend to the garden. The Bible says Jesus is the second Adam. Just as the first Adam was a gardener, so the second Adam is now mistaken for a gardener. The first Adam took his bride from the garden to the grave. Right There they were in the garden, and because of the failure of the first Adam, they have to leave the garden, and today you will die. From the garden to the grave, because of sin. The second Adam reverses the process. He takes his bride, the church, from the tomb to the garden, by defeating sin, by taking Adam's sin on himself and 
the sons of Adam's sin on himself. Adam took us to a tomb. Christ takes us out of the tomb. So Genesis is all about how, how the garden is lost. Paradise is lost. We exchange the garden for the grave. That's the beginning of the Bible. We get to the end of the Bible. What happens? We sang about it in name of all majesty. It's a bit of a coincidence on my part. I didn't mean to make this connection. Eden restored, do you remember? Well, that's Revelation 21 and 22, isn't it? We're back in the garden by the end. And we're there with the second Adam. And now we're the bride of Christ. And the two are joined together in that great wedding ceremony. It's a new Adam and Eve, you see. What was lost is now restored. And death is undone and every tear is wiped away. And in this garden, we have the death-defeating gardener who meets Mary Magdalene and comforts her with the ascension. I mentioned two simple ways in which the ascension is comforting. Firstly, Jesus says the ascension is not yet. Verse 17, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. On resurrection morning, the risen Jesus had nothing left to achieve, if you like, before his ascension. Everything was done. Everything was achieved. His work was complete. And at the moment he rose from the tomb, he was ready to be ascended. And yet he delays it. Not yet. There's a particular timing for the ascension. Why is it not yet? So that Jesus can comfort grieving friends. Jesus' ascension was not yet because he chose to come alongside Mary and to comfort her. He tells her to go to the disciples. You comfort them as well. Tell them the message. Tell them the news. So Jesus appears to them, he comforts them, he shows his hands, his side, he eats breakfast with them, he restores Peter. Jesus was well within his rights to have ascended at dawn on that Sunday morning. But he delays it, not yet, because he's got people to comfort, to comfort his tearful friends. Remarkable kindness of Jesus. Here is Jesus, about to take to his heavenly throne, fulfill those Old Testament prophecies, sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high and take his rightful place as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but, but not yet, because one of my friends is upset. He comes alongside Mary to comfort her. Paul tells us in Romans, we should consider the kindness of God to us. A few kinder images than the King of Kings Stepping aside from his coronation, from the procession to his throne to comfort a friend. Imagine that if our dear elderly queen passes away sometime soon, and perhaps King William, I don't know, King William takes his throne. Big procession in London. Where, where, where did he get coronated now? I wasn't alive for the last one. <laughs> Is it Westminster Abbey or something like that? Well, where, wherever it would be. Let's say Westminster Abbey for the sake of it. And they're, and they're lining the streets, and there he is in all of his robes, all his firemen, about to be coronated, going up the steps. And suddenly his ringtone goes off in his pocket. A friend's grieving. A friend's ill. He steps aside from his coronation, catches a taxi to the side of London to comfort a friend. He said, what a remarkable act. How much more with the King of Kings here? We must never doubt the kindness of God towards us. Remarkably kind saints. The, the, the second thing to say, well, there's much more we could say on this verse, but the second thing to say, it's not yet. Second thing, the ascension is not private. Jesus says, do not hold on to me. Understandably, Mary wants to cling on to Jesus. She wants to hold him and never let go. Last time she saw Jesus, he was breathing his agonising last breath, then being wrapped in Linen and laid in this tomb and this stone rolled over. I'll never see him again. Of course she's clinging on to him. I mentioned it a while ago, uh, back when it happened, and it was last year we went down to London as a family and Edith got lost, her daughter Edith got lost in the British Museum. She was searching around. When we found her, I thought, right, that's it, I'm never letting go. <laughs> when you get married, you, you're gonna, I'm going to have to be hugging you and you know, your first child, I'm going to be... Never going to let go. That's how you feel, right? You, you think you've lost someone, then you find them, and how much more with Jesus? But Jesus was not risen just for Mary's benefit. Jesus had risen to comfort others and to save others and to rescue us and forgive others. Now, as a Messiah on earth, he could only spend so much time with so many people. 
But as the ascended king, he could minister to all of his people across the world. He could send his spirit to comfort those in need. Mary needs to stop holding on to Jesus so that Jesus can hold on to all of his people across the world. <coughs> Notice the language Jesus uses in verse 17. Lovely language. Again, so kind. Go to my brothers. Now, if you really want to do some homework afterwards, you could say, does Jesus ever use language like that elsewhere in the Gospels? I'm not sure he does. So he uses it sometimes generally, my brothers. You know, I mentioned the incident this morning from the, from the Synoptic Gospels where Jesus' brothers and sisters and mother come to him um, and he says, these are my brothers and sisters and mother, doesn't he, to, to the crowd, those who believe. He uses that phrase generally, but here, go to my brothers. The ascended Jesus calls his disciples my brothers. Paul says that Jesus, in Romans chapter 8, Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers. In his resurrection and ascension, he's the firstborn amongst many brothers. The ascended Christ is in the business of adoption. So from his throne, the ascended Jesus adopts people into his new family, new brothers, new sisters, new children of the ascended king. So Mary, don't hold on to me because you're not the only one who needs comforts. I have other brothers and sisters to attend to. I have sheep of other flocks to bring in. So of course he says in John's gospel, starting with the disciples, comfort my brothers, but then from his heavenly throne, he goes on to adopt people from across the world into his family, down through the generations to, even to us, in Warsaw in 2022. I must ascend to my father and your father, so that I can meet the need of every brother and sister and child of God of mine around the world. We'll close there, and uh, we'll, we'll sing together our closing song. I'll pray for us, and then we'll, we'll stand and sing. Um, Dal, could you, would you mind shouting out the closing song when you've had off? 614, which is what a friend we have in Jesus. In praise. In praise, thank you, in the blue praise book. All our <coughs> griefs to bear, which seems to fit in well with the situation of the marriage. So I'll, I'll pray that we'll stand to sing what a friend we have in Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your characteristics that are displayed through your resurrection and ascension. We thank you for the humility displayed that the one who ascended must also have descended to the lower earthly regions. We thank you for, for the humility implied by your ascension. We thank you for the gentleness and kindness, for the sympathetic high priest that we have who knows our weaknesses and our needs and therefore can help us in our time of need. And we thank you for this wonderful display of kindness here through Mary and to the other followers of Jesus as well, to the apostles and disciples. We thank you for that wonderful kindness displayed. And we pray that we would indeed hear Paul's challenge to us tonight to consider the kindness of God to you.